Take your Bibles, if you would, uh, up on the screen. Sec- let's start at Second Samuel, and then Second Corinthians six. Um, I'm going to teach. I'm going to teach probably more than I preach. Um, God laid this on my heart to uh, preach on raising children. Now, there's going to be dozens of applications for this. Because maybe your children's grown up, but you're still their parent. The Bible says to honor thy father and thy mother. It does not put an expiration date on that. Now, I am my own man, and there are times when my mother has had to step into my life and say, son, you're not doing right, as an adult. And I had to honor that. I got into an argument one time with my mom, and that didn't go well. I should have never done that. That was wicked of me. And what she was saying to me was not wrong. So it, there's several ways that you can apply this. If you have children, then God has ways for us to raise those children. If you are a child, I want the young people to listen. There's expectations of you that God lays on you. And when I first thought about doing this, I thought about making examples of how I raised my children, but the problem is I made mistakes. I didn't always do right. So it would, it would be wrong for me to stand up here and be some sort of expert on the right way to raise children when I didn't do it right. So I got to thinking about it. I actually know a guy who did. He's perfect at it. His name is God. And he is raising me. So the title of the sermon is How God is Raising Mike. Okay? And, there's a, and again, there's a lot of ways you can apply this. This is God dealing with you. This is you dealing with your children. This may be you dealing with your adult children. This may be you in a work environment on how to be a good boss or a good manager. There's all kinds of practical teachings on this. There's ways that we as church members ought to act. You can sort of see me as the head of the church, the physical head of the church. Christ is the big head over the church. And there's just many, many applications on how this applies. Look at it in a way of salvation. If you are truly saved, you are a child of God. Truly saved, you are a child of God. And God has ways of raising us, and all of those are written down in the Scriptures. And it's, I spent a lot of time putting this together, and I know it's not just going to be one sermon. So I'm going to cut off, I'm going to give you some baloney and cut it off. Next week I'll give you some more baloney, cut it off. That way we can just have little pieces of it, all right? We're going to, and some of it's going to be pretty rough, because we're going to deal with how God deals with wayward children. Part of it, I already know it's in my notes is going to be how God exposes wicked parents. Because how dare you tell your child not to do something that you are doing? How dare you have a filthy, dirty mouth and then tell your children not to say those words? They got, they learn them from you. You're a wicked example to your children. And part of this is going to be us being an example. And these children in this church, I remember when I was their age, riding that bus, 
And the adults in this church were all like parents to me. I regarded them that way. And if Brother Waymire got on to me about something, I was as scared of him as I was a grizzly bear. If that man caught me running or doing something in church and he got on to me, you know, my mama never got mad at him for doing that. He went and told my mama what I was doing. My mama took me home with me. So part of this is how us as adults in this church ought to be examples to all of these children, even if they're not ours. 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is what God said to David, to Solomon, about Solomon, but about Christ as well. Because we know Solomon was a type of Jesus Christ. The thousand women that Solomon had, believe it or not, are a picture of the thousand year reign of Christ. Solomon reigned a thousand years before Christ. The numbers add up. Solomon is the one who built the temple. Jesus, when he comes back, is going to build his own temple out of us, believe it or not. Won't that be good looking? Okay, anyway, I, this, that's a different sermon, but there's many ways to look at this. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. All you guys, hey, listen. Hey, put a Bible in your hand and listen while I'm preaching. Good girl. Good job. Okay, I want you, to, I want you young people to listen. Because you'll remember these things. Because I did. When thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, means when you're dead, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. So you can see he's talking dual. He's talking about Solomon, and Christ was the son of David. So verse 13, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So he's talking about Solomon, and he's talking about Christ. And in verse 14 now, listen to what he's saying. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. That's Christ. Now, Solomon was the one who got the rod put to him for his sins. Jesus didn't need it, because he didn't sin. So he said, I will be his father, and he shall be my son, if he commit iniquity. I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul whom I put away before thee. Now look at 2 Corinthians 6. You can look up on the screen. You can turn there very quickly. I'll turn there give you a chance. Let's see who beats who. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Boy, I'm there. Verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Young people, there are places that your mom and dad will never let you go to, so don't bother asking. Their job your mom and dad knows where the danger is, don't they? They know where the threats are. They get a vibe about some guy in the neighborhood or some gal or some other kid. And they say, I don't want you hanging around them. That's, you look at what I just read. God says, even to us as adults, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And I'm going to say this. Being a child of God is conditional. It's conditional. On you being different than the world is. Okay? This is how God raised, is raising me. I had a lot of world in me that God has beat out of me. 
and I mean beat out of me, just like my mama did when I caught the woods on fire, when I burnt little David's treehouse down, when I smarted off to her, when I lied to her, and other things that I will not mention. She got me. Let's pray. Father, you're going to have to take this sermon and preach it. Because I can't do it right. I'm not, I'm not qualified. I made some pretty rotten mistakes with my children. I didn't do right. So, Father, I'm going to let this be about you raising a child, me. I pray, dear God, you bless all these children. I pray, God, that you would protect them. Don't let anybody hurt them. Don't let anybody hurt them. Keep them all safe. Give them sound wisdom. Give them guidance and instruction. Bless their parents. Help them to raise them in a godly way. Help them to raise them according to Scripture. Help them to raise them the way you're raising us. Lord, give us many, many applications. Give us a lot of wisdom out of what you're going to speak and what you're going to say to these people and to me. So may your blessings be upon us. God, help me preach this, I pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Now, let's just, let's just take some time here, 2 Samuel chapter 7. When God said, He'll be, I will, I'll be his father, he shall be my son. He meant exactly that. And we know that Solomon committed a lot of sins. We know that he did. He had 700 wives. And he had 300 concubines. These were women that he just slept with that he didn't, he, he didn't even marry them. He, they were just, he had every kind of woman that every man could ever lust after. Solomon had it. And then he built pagan temples for all their gods. And burned incense to them. But God, God let him do that. Men, men, listen. Solomon had what you wanted. And he didn't like it. He had it all. He had all the women. He had all the, he had all the wine and strong drink. He had all the parties. He had, he had all the chariots. He had music. He, had, he, had, he was owner of the world. He was king of the world. He had all the power, all the money. All the wives, all the wealth, all the sins, he did them all. And God let him retain his wisdom throughout all those 40 years that he did that. At the end of his life, he's writing Ecclesiastes and he's telling us men, don't do it, man. Don't, it, it, it's not there. I tried it. I had it all. Everything you could lust after, I had it. God allowed me to have it, but God allowed me to retain my wisdom to look back at my life and see that it was all vanity. And what you're chasing down as a man, what you're trying to conquer, what sins you're trying to... Because you think that those sins are going to bring you great pleasure. And Solomon said they don't. They end up doing more harm than anything you could ever desire. It's not worth it, men. So God, but here's God. God's a very loving God. And he's very long-suffering. So he says to David, David, he's going to be rotten. I'm telling you, he's going to be rotten. But here's, here's my promise to him. I will always be his father. And he will always be my son. And nothing, there's not a sin in this world that's going to separate my love from him. I will always have mercy on him. Parents. Don't forget that. Don't forget to forgive your children. Because it's not worth it holding a grudge. So don't forget to have mercy on them. They're always going to be your children. 
And God said, for everything that he does, I'll take a rod. If he, if he, if he goes wrong, I'll take care of him. Now, the reason why I bring God into this thing is because God knows everything that I've ever done. Right and wrong. Doesn't he? God knows all the thoughts, all the actions, all the deeds, all the words. God knows it all. And I promise you, I promise you, God doesn't let me get away with anything. He's always chasing me. He al- now, my mom didn't whip me for every little infraction that I did. Did your parents, did your mom, Gary, did your mom and dad whip you for every little thing? See, that's not wise, is it? We don't do that to our children. We might scold them a little bit, tell them, hey, you're not doing right. But after a while, you've got a line that they cross, and when they cross that line, you say, okay, I've had enough. I had a fifth grade teacher that I loved this man. He and I were, he and I wrote letters to each other as pen pals after I got out of the fifth grade, went to the middle school. He moved down to Texas to teach down there, and we were pen pals for years. This man gave me the very first whipping I ever had in school. I was so special to him that he had me sit right by his desk. Because I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I had to be the clown of everything. And one day, he warned me, Mike, if I catch you, he had a line. He told me about something that I shouldn't do. I forgot what it was. But he sent some students out for, to get a drink. And I took off running down the hall. And he took off running after me and grabbed me by the arm. And he took me down to Mr. Moutre's, we called him Mr. Moo Cow because he was fat. Mr. Moutre's office. And he shot my eyes out of my eye sockets. He hit me so hard with that paddle three times. I thought I was going to die there. He gave me the first whipping I ever had in school. And it hurt. But that man loved me. I, when I got in college, during an interim between semesters, I spent the summer in Texas. I looked. You know how hard it is to find a Gary Brown in Houston, Texas? There's 20 of them. I found him. And I went to visit him and spent the day with him. That's how special that man was to me. He, I loved him and he loved me in a righteous way. And he loved me enough to tear my hide apart when I did wrong. He had a line that I shouldn't cross. And when I crossed it, he got me. Amen? Lisa and I tried to do that with our children. We want our children to raise their children in a similar way doing better than we did is what I want out of my children so he told him I'll be his father and he shall be my son God says second Corinthians I'll be a father in you and you shall be my son but that stuff that you used to be a part of you're coming out of it you may go kicking and screaming but you're coming out of it and I will, if I have to use a rod to get you out of it, I will. But what does Psalm 23 say about our shepherd? Thy rod and thy staff, they what? Comfort me. Do you know what that means? God has put it into the minds. See, God built this, this psychiatry of your children, not Dr. Spock. Not the analyzers and the Dr. Phil's of this world. God is the one who built the psychiatry of your children. And God knows that in children, they know where their protection comes from. It comes from the ones who have authority over them. Remember that sermon I preached? Where there's authority, there's protection? You may whip them. And you may feel bad. If I whip them, they're going to hate my guts. No, because when they, come, when they need comfort, they're going to come running to you. They need that safety. They find comfort in the rod. And so do I. Because I know that when God chastens me, 
He's doing it because he loves me. And that tells me that I am his son. And he loves me. Turn to Psalm 127. Now, this is good wisdom here. I'm not going to give you fluff. I'm going to give you solid, good, good, good stuff. I was, it, as I was building these notes, putting these together, I'm telling you, God really opened my eyes to some things. Psalm 127, verse 1. This is to every man, woman. This is to our church. This is to you in your life. You apply this in your life. Look at verse 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Psalm 127, verse 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. You, guys listen, moms listen. You cannot, you cannot. Raise children without God's help in this world. There are devils out there waiting to destroy your children. There are evil kids out there that 20 years from now are going to end up in jail that are wanting to befriend your children. Aren't they? There are pedophiles out there that want your children. Aren't they? It's your job to protect them, and you can't do it without God. Unless God builds the house, you're going to labor in vain. See, God will put wisdom in us, and he'll, let it, he'll give us the wisdom of a watchman. Our kids will be playing with some kid, and God will just get this thing in us. God will tell us, you better, better keep your kid away from that kid. I know, I've been to that kid's house. I know what he does at home. I know what he does in his neighborhood. I know who he is. You better watch that kid. And my mom warned me about some kids I was floating around with. You better stay away from him. And I didn't heed her word, and she was right. So in whatever it is, I, you know what? When I tried to build this church, I labored in vain. Because that was... In the time when I thought it was up to me to get people in the church. So I was going to be like this Rick Warren guy. Everything that I hate now, I was going to be that guy. And God whooped the fire. I was going to have a rock and roll show on this stage. You remember that, don't you, Sterling? And God whipped me hard over that. And I called it off just in time. I lost a friend over it. But God was telling me, Mike. See, what happened was, we had an Easter service. And we had, I mean, we had all the pews full. And I come through like on a Monday. I went to the bathroom and I came back and I looked at the board out there. Sister Bernice used to put the numbers out there. And I saw that we had like 115 there in church. And I went, boy, Mike, you're doing a good job. And I'm not kidding you, God grabbed me by the neck, took me down to this altar, and he said, Mike, this is my church. I will build it. I will decide who comes in here or who leaves. That's my choice. It's not yours. Now, if you will let me, I will build this place in a way that you, you could never fathom and you could never do. But if you don't trust me, I'll take you out and I'll put somebody in your place. Now, Listen to this one. Wives and husbands. We're living in a day where divorce is rampant. And if you will not do right in your family and in your house, you're going to end up paying alimony and child support. And you'll never get to see your kids ever again. Am I telling the truth? Except the Lord build the house that labor in vain that build it. So you know what happened? I pulled back and I said, God, you do it. 
there's probably about 14, 1,500 families watching us right now. I could have never done that, ever. That's what God did. That's why I don't get to take the credit for it. Amen? So guys, listen, if you'll let God build your house instead of you trying what you think is right, God will bless it. But if you leave him out of it and leave his principles out of it, you'll fail. And that applies in everything. If you're, if you're on the job site, you're a boss, foreman, manager, overseer, whatever, superintendent, if you'll let, did, did not God bless Joseph when he was the servant to, uh, what was his name? Huh? Potiphar? Did not God bless Joseph? Potiphar didn't even know what he had in his hand except the food in front of him. But he put Joseph in charge of everything and God made Potiphar a wealthy man through the hands of Joseph. And God blessed Joseph so much that he ended up being the second in command of the entire world at that time. This is how true this stuff is. Now verse 2. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. See, you're going to get so stressed out about how bad things are going. You won't sleep at night. You'll be getting up early. You'll be wallowing in your own sorrow. But God gives His beloved sleep. God will bless your house so that when you go to bed at night, you'll sleep in peace knowing that God is in charge. Amen. Now look at verse 3. Child, lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is His reward. Somebody say amen to that. Children are supposed to be a blessing to moms and dads. That means moms and dads don't go running out partying every night. Leaving their children at home by themselves or leaving their children with some infidel raising them or babysitting them. And God knows what else. Why would you leave your children with somebody you don't know, somebody you don't trust? Those are your children. You're supposed to be raising them. You're supposed to be at home with them. Not out getting drunk every night, partying every night. I said I was going to teach, not preach. Children are in heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is His reward. That's the way we're supposed to see our children. Not as something that gets in our way all the time. Not somebody you curse. You ever curse your children, you ought to have your mouth washed out with soap. God ought to take you out and whoop the fire out of you for that. Don't you ever curse your children. Or curse at them. Or curse in their presence. Or curse behind their back. Now look at verse 4. Took me a while to learn this. As arrows in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Here's, here, it took me a long time to figure this out. And I had a preacher that preached on this. And he said something and it just, just clicked. We're to raise our children. Listen now. We're to raise our children straight and true. Like an arrow. What direction does a crooked arrow go? A crooked direction. Who is it that's supposed to refine and shape those children? Parents. Not the school. Not the babysitter. Not the tablet. Used to be the TV, now it's the tablet. It's the parent. Because one of these days, see the enemies are out there. You raise your children good and straight and true. One of these days when they're ready, 
they're going to be a weapon against all the evil in this world. <laughs> you shoot them out and let them go stand in the presence of evil like you've been doing in your life. <laughs> God's trying to make us, as His children, Brian, straight and true. So that instead of us being on the side of all the evil people, when God has taken us and He's ready, He uses us to shoot down all the enemies. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. That's how God is trying to raise me. And you think about that. I, I can't tell you a lot, but what I can tell you is that in all the years of my life, God has worked to try to make me straight and true. And I don't think I'm quite there yet. But I don't mind being used by God to stand against our enemies. So that God is happy to have me as one of his arrows that he uses against all the enemies. You see that? You understand that? That's what God's trying to do to you, Wayne, and you, Gary, and you, Sterling, and you, Ron, and you, Brian, and all you guys, and all you ladies. God's trying to make you straight and true to use you to stand against the enemies so that God is proud to have you in his quiver. Because one of these days, you know what we're going to do? We are going to judge angels. Evil angels. We are going to judge them and throw them in the lake of fire. We're going to stomp on Satan's head. Our own feet are going to do that. May the God of heaven bruise Satan under your feet shortly. But see, God's got to work to make us straight and true arrows. And that's what he's doing to you. He's refining you. He's notching you. He's polishing you. He's making you so you're right. Amen? Now, boy, I don't know if I want to get into it. Yeah, let's do this. Turn to John 3. I'll teach this. Well, we had some good singing, amen? Maybe I didn't sing it all quite as well as I could, but I enjoyed it. I had to get it out of me. John 3. This is Nicodemus. Verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, verily I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter in the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, You, you must be born again. Now, here's what I'm going to say to all my children. Hang, hang, hang with me for a minute. Okay? Here's what Lisa and I realized with our children. They were conceived by us, which means they were conceived in iniquity. That's what David said. I was conceived in iniquity in my mother's womb. I was born a sinner. We made four filthy, rotten, dirty sinners. We adopted a fifth one. And we found out that even though we tried to raise them in a right way, they're still sinners. 
them just being born of Pastor Mike Hoggard does not gain them entrance into the kingdom of God. They must be born again. And if my children are not born again, you will go to hell. You have to be born of God. So, 1 Peter 1, 22. I'll turn there. I'll see if I can beat you to it. I'm there. 1 Peter 1, verse 22. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now, get this. Ross and I are brothers. He was born again. I was born again. It would never, ever, ever be right for me to hate my brother. Now, hang on. Sometimes family members fight. Like brothers. Like me and Melissa. You should have seen the stuff we did to each other. It was not pretty. So that's why we got doses of castor oil. Because when we fought, mom made us drink castor oil. Now, I hate that stuff. What in the world was God thinking when he made that stuff? Okay? But, I love her now more than I love myself. Because we're family. And even when family doesn't get along every now and then, at the end of the day, it ought to be over with. That's how adults do it. Grown-ups. This is what I expect out of my children. And then my grandchildren. Because they're going to get in little spats between them. Cousins do that. Did you know that Korah and Moses were first cousins? You go look that up. Korah was the one who stood against Moses and the ground opened up and swallowed him and 250 men with him. Remember that? Korah and Moses were first cousins. The lineage is given there and they both had their brothers, their dads were brothers. I never knew, I just, I'm going, that's how families are sometimes. Because you'll have evil family members that you cannot get along with. And you're best to find a different family. That's why we're in the family of God. We're supposed to, you read that verse again. We're supposed to treat each other in brotherly love. As brothers and sisters together. And every now and then if we don't get along, that happens. But at the end of the day, we're still brethren. This is how I pastor this church, and I expect nothing less from everybody that comes here. If you come here to fight everybody, you leave. Because I'm not going to have it. Then, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, that's the world, of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth, Forever. So, if Ross is born again, and I'm born again of incorruptible seed, that means we are in our inner man is incorruptible, and he and I are going to be brothers forever. Amen. So you might as well love them. Because now you're different, and you're supposed to be different than you used to be. Amen. And what I'm going to teach you next Sunday, I want everybody to listen. This is going to be deep stuff here. 
God, let me say it this way. Lisa and I conceived children by our love for one another. You understand that? And we conceived them because we wanted them. And we still do want them. We conceived them in love. The way God conceived us. Because He loves us. Why did God... Wayne put up with me and all the things that I did wrong in my life. Why did God long suffer with me? God, why was God so kind to me? Why did God give me a pulpit? Why did God give me this family that we have? Why did God give me this ministry? Why did God give me those four children that we rescued? Why did God do that? Because he loved me was conceived in love. John 1, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And John 3, 1 John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. And what he's telling you here is the same reason why Lisa and I brought forth our children into this world. It's because we love them. And our grandchildren. We're going to end up with 15 by the end of next summer. When's yours? April? When's yours? March? Paige has got one coming. They follow their mom and dad's example. Bust them kids out, man. You know why? God used Lindsay, the first one, to show me his love for me so that I would know because I loved Lindsay and then I loved Alicia and then I loved Sparky the firehead they're special to me my girls my girls are my life we conceived them in love and they conceived their children in love and Lisa and I loved every one of them. And we'll not fail to do everything we can for them. Amen? You know what I'm talking about? So that's God with us. If I, being evil, can bring forth my children and grandchildren in that love, how much more God conceived me by his love. What manner of love God has bestowed upon us that we could be called the sons of God. Let's bow our heads. This is just the introduction to the, to the messages. But there's a lot to learn. I, I, boy, I made notes like crazy. God was just pouring this stuff into me. And I'm not done making notes. There's still more that I think I need to cover. So we're going to be here for a while. But this morning, I want you to ask yourself number, this first question. Are you a child of God? And I'll tell you this. If you know that I love you, and I do, then you should know also that God loves you 
way more than I love you. And I love each and every person in this room and online. I love you people with all my heart. I'm here to give everything that I have for your benefit and your blessing. And if I, being as evil as I am, can love you that way, how much more does God love you? And He's not evil. So I want you to ask yourself this morning, are you born again? I want the children listening to me to ask the question, are you born again? Are you saved? I was nine years old when God finally made me understand that I needed to be saved. And if you want to know what it is to be saved, then you talk to your parents and you can come to me or you can talk to them. We let our children come to us and ask for salvation. We never pushed it on them. And in time, each one of them did. So you can ask, like I asked my mom, Mom, can I get saved? Yeah. But I just want to ask you this morning, are you born again? Father in heaven, I come before you today and I thank you, God, for the message. I thank you, God, for what you've done in my life. What you've done through my life. I have nothing but thanks and praise to offer you. And I pray, Father, that each and every one listening to me today would know, would know that they are born again, conceived in love by the Heavenly Father that you are. You love us so much that you sacrificed your only begotten Son. For us filthy sinners. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. So Father I pray dear God that each and every person today. Whether it's today, tomorrow, next week, next year. Before they leave this earth God they will know. That they are born again. Father I know you well enough to know. That who you're going to save, you will do it in your time. And I don't need to push anybody here. So Father, when, when somebody says, I think I need to be saved. That'll be you doing it and not me. So Father, bless each and every one. Thank you God for letting us be your children and for being our father. We need you. Some people, some people hearing me today did not have a father. Never had a father. But they have one now. And that father is you. So Father, bless the words. Bless your word. Speak to hearts. Deal with me. Continue, Father, to straighten me and make me true. Bless this message. Bless these people. We pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen.